um, everybody, what an incredible pleasure and honor to launch right in into the August 2022 edition of Living Histories with uh, Professor David Nelson's Living Histories talk. Um, I am dying to hear, as I know all of you are, I will just let David tell us the story in his own words. Thank you. Please take it away, David. Okay, and uh, Shri, if you could tell me when I have, say, three minutes left or so, I'll, I'll, I will I'll definitely try not to run over. Um, so so um, uh, I thought I would say a little bit uh, about uh, my uh, somewhat varied education, um, uh, but I have to make sure that I can advance uh, the slideshow here, which doesn't seem to be happening, unfortunately. Um, click on the mouse. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, there we go. Thank you. All right, good. So um, uh, the uh, uh, first, my, my parents, my father was the grandson of a Swedish lumberjack in northern Wisconsin, but he went to West Point, joined the Corps of Engineers and went all over the world um, uh, doing various uh, uh, projects, mostly civil engineering. Um, there he is. Uh, my mother, um, was the valedictorian of her high school class. My father was only a salutatorian. Uh, she went to Vassar College and majored in zoology. Uh, she then uh, traveled the world with my dad and eventually became a speech therapist. Um, uh, I don't have a picture of her. I, I do, of course, but I, I'm, I'm traveling. and I couldn't get one, but I could find the, uh, uh, the music uh, that uh, I, I sang uh, at her funeral. Uh, so if anybody's interested, I'm the music <laughs> is down there. Uh, are you seeing this control bar again, uh, perhaps, Shri? Uh, no, you, okay, everything's good. perfect. Good, I will, I will pretend it's not there um, and move on. Um, uh, and I need to click on this, as you say, let me try to do this clicking, which now <laughs> seems not to be, uh, I'm gonna hide floating controls. Uh, I am going to get rid of this stupid laser pointer, which maybe is causing trouble. There we go. So uh, as a result of this uh, peripatetic uh, set of parents, um, I followed them around the world and grew up in 15 different places with four different high schools. Um, uh, fortunately for me, um, my senior year, uh, I had a fantastic uh, mathematics teacher named Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Brown taught us a college level calculus course out of this textbook, uh, Thomas, some of you may be familiar with it. Um, he was quite a character. He would give these beautiful lectures and he would take his lecture notes and crumple them up and throw them in the wastebasket uh, to force himself to rethink the material for the following year. Um, my high school really didn't have uh, a decent physics course, but I wanted to learn it. And then one day my mother came home. She was taking uh, courses on speech therapy at Georgetown University uh, in Washington, DC. And she came home with this textbook um, that was around December of my senior year. And uh, it was the course, this book that many of you know by Halliday and Resnick. And I found I could just read the first half and I was absolutely smitten. Uh, with, uh, with physics and all the beautiful things in there. And it was a calculus-based course, so uh, I could understand it. Um, I then went off to uh, something called, a now defunct program called the uh, Cornell Six-Year PhD Program. That's the, uh, the picture that uh, they like to show you in all the brochures about what a beautiful campus it is, uh, hiding the fact that it's mostly cloudy, uh, for uh, 250 days out of the year. Um, but also it's slightly misleading because uh, the serious work, at least when I was there, went on in Clark Hall. And what you're seeing is the back view. This is where I used to park my car at night uh, when I went up to work uh, in the evening as a graduate student. I also worked on the library, which you can see with the black glass on the second floor um, uh, almost every, every evening. Um, and lots of beautiful things happened in the basement, which is where all the experimentalists hung out, and up on the fifth and sixth floor, which were lots of famous theorists like uh, Ashcroft and Merman and Amber Gauker uh, were, uh, were working. Um, and for me, the main 
thing about this funny program was that um, I could move fast. And uh, so after my first three years, uh, I'd actually taken almost all the courses that Cornell had to offer and I was ready to do research. And just by coincidence, um, in 1972, when I, I continued in the graduate portion of this program, uh, Ken Wilson's beautiful work happened to be published in 1971, was finally getting some recognition. And I remember wandering around that Clark Hall Library uh, late one night, taking a break and discovering that, gosh, this um, field theorist named Ken Wilson, who was already quite famous at Cornell, was no longer publishing in Physical Review D, which is where high energy theorists used to publish, but he published his paper in Physical Review B. And there's this strange picture of the Hamiltonian represented as a ball rolling down a highly overdamped hill. And this was supposed to have something to do with phase transitions. And so um, I, 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 my senior year or my third year at, at Cornell, I said, wow, this is kind of fascinating. I need to find out more. Um, uh, Ken Wilson is shown here. Uh, he taught me graduate quantum mechanics and uh, along with uh, Hans Beta. Uh, in the end, I didn't work with him per se, but I uh, was one of my heroes and, and I regard him as a mentor. My actual mentor at Cornell was Michael Fisher. And in 1972, when I entered graduate school, uh, Wilson and Fisher uh, published their famous uh, paper on the epsilon expansion uh, for uh, critical exponents. And uh, that also uh, really attracted my attention, the notion of physics in 3.99 dimensions uh, was really wild and, and appealing. And uh, the, Cornell was the uh, epicenter of this revolution. And it's happened right when I entered graduate school, uh, as did the discovery of the superfluid phases of helium-3 by uh, Asheroff, Lee, uh, and Richardson. And uh, uh, you know, four out of the, those five people won Nobel Prizes. Michael Fisher probably should have won one as well. So it was a, I was very spoiled. I thought this is how physics was going to be for the rest of my career. It hasn't quite been like that, but it was a very exciting time. So after doing a PhD on neuromalization group methods and so forth, learning from my first two mentors, uh, Ken and Michael, uh, I moved to uh, Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. Um, here's an aerial view of Harvard Yard. Um, but again, the real work from my perspective went on uh, much of it here in Lyman Laboratory. And uh, it was also an exciting time uh, to be in Cambridge, Mass. And uh, I think uh, Bob Bergenau and Dave Lutzer were just beginning to do beautiful things down at MIT. And there were these experimentalists nearby. And my first year as a postdoc, uh, I was able to work with uh, Leo Kadanoff. Leo wasn't in Cambridge, Mass at the time, but he was at Brown University, which was quite close by. So he would drive up, uh, I would drive down to uh, Brown, in Providence, Rhode Island, and, and we had a, a very enjoyable collaboration about the two dimensional XY model. And I remember uh, telling Leo about this, there was this really interesting paper by Kosterlitz and Thales. Uh, why didn't we go look it up in their science library? And Leo said, where's that? Um, he, uh, uh, was amazingly creative and really didn't need libraries to a first approximation, but he made an exception that day and we went over and looked up and found this seminal paper, which uh, played a big role in our, our subsequent research. And then uh, my string of luck continued uh, somewhat because the next uh, year, my second year of a postdoc, um, Bert Halpern showed up from Bell Labs and uh, I regard him also as, as one of my uh, mentors. And uh, I thought I knew a lot of stuff, but when Bert showed up, I, I realized there was a lot more to learn. And uh, so we had some wonderful collaborations and uh, Leo and Bert, um, in fact, uh, uh, sort of launched me uh, into this world of defects uh, in, in condensed matter physics or defects in geometry. 
uh, in condensed matter physics, which is what I did for uh, the next 20 years or so. I moved uh, around even David, within the field. Yes. This is your couple of minutes warning. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you for the warning. Um, and uh, then uh, it's an ap apropos warning because uh, I'm now going to move on to physical biology. So what next? Well, thanks in part to uh, Cherry Murray, who I guess we'll be hearing from. I was doing some consulting at Bell Labs and people down there were getting very excited about the possibilities in doing uh, biological physics or physical biology like Boris Schreiman and Sebastian Sung. Uh, and these explorations uh, were facilitated by uh, two wonderful experimentalists. Um, uh, I often ask people if I could work in their lab and basically Bob Myers said no, Albert Lipschebe said no when I was on a sabbatical, but Sherrod Ramanathan, who was nurtured at Bell Labs, said yes, perhaps because he too had used to, used to be a theorist. I still am, but he's now a, a, a world-class uh, biological experimenter and that led to the, these uh, range expansions that some of you might have heard of, which was done in collaboration with uh, Oscar Herlacek. Uh, I actually did this particular experiment, and uh, it was a it was relatively easy, but really interesting to think about, and it's influenced uh, my work on spatial population genetics. My other uh, friend and, and experimental mentor uh, 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 was in our department of molecular and cellular biology. Andrew Murray uh, led to this um, uh, range expansion down here. I don't know if I can actually make it work, but I'm rather proud of it. Uh, it was done uh, by Severine Addis and uh, the experiments themselves and, and Brian Weinstein with some help uh, uh, with, uh, from Andrew Murray on sort of, uh, he's kind of a genetic alchemist. He can make yeast to many beautiful things, including what you just saw, this fireworks display. So I will conclude uh, by following some of my predecessors. What advice would I give to people starting out in science? I would emphatically say, don't follow fashions. Um, uh, back uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, science and nature didn't have the, uh, the power that they do now, but people were always trying to publish PhysRev letters, and uh, it got to the point where they would make an analogy between fox hunting, where the fox would go off and every hound in the universe, at least all the theorist hounds, would go follow it. And that's probably not the best way to make progress, certainly not in physical biology, where there are many, many, many foxes. Uh, I would encourage uh, the audience, the younger people, to do curiosity-driven research. Don't just follow fashions. We used to talk about holy grails. And, you know, holy grails are in the eye of the beholder. You should decide what your own holy grail is and not just be influenced by, by fashion. It was help, help, been helpful for me to change fields every five years. Um, experimenters are your friends. Uh, make friends with them. They may not, they, a lot of them drink beer instead of wine uh, at dinner, but they're good people. And I, I, I enjoy drinking beer with them. And if you can, uh, uh, and experiments aren't too technically demanding, especially possible in physical biology, I would urge you to spend a summer uh, or a semester in a lab. So I'll stop there. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you so much, David. I mean, so many questions, but in the interest of time, let me choose one from myself, which is you didn't tell us what motivated this transition from um, yes. boring um, matter physics to exciting matter physics. So would you please tell us? Well, I think it's all exciting. And, and you know, I'm, I'm actually, uh, the truth be known, I half of my work now is working on graphene and some of the other things that still go back to traditional condensed matter physics. But the transition uh, which happened for me uh, 25 years ago, I was a department chair of physics. Bob Bergenau knows about that. Um, I still blame him for, for that uh, experience. Uh, but to keep my sanity, I went down to MIT and I sat in the back and audited a freshman biology course, maybe in 1998. And it was just beautifully presented. And in a single semester, they took you through this revolution in molecular biology that had happened in the 70s and the 80s. And uh, to me, it looked like physics must have been in the 1920s and 30s when people were discovering the electron, the proton, and the neutron. So it seemed like there was lots of low-hanging fruit, and uh, that motivated me to, to move, move in. And uh, of course, my colleagues at Bell Labs, where I was consulting, 
uh, we're, we're doing similar things at the same time. Great. Thank you so much, uh, David. Um, I'm wrapping the recording in the interest of time, but I think, oh, there are questions in chat, which I'll let you take in chat, but I'm closing the recording and thank you, thanking you again on behalf of the audience. Very good.